so much, how are you?
make sure my mic's on. How are y'all doing this morning? Good. Good. Thank you. Um, waiting on the computer to start up here. It wasn't um, on just yet. I thought it was, but it wasn't. So uh, just to remind you, next Thursday we're going to have a test. Okay. So that'll be our last regular test, I guess you could say, before the final exam. Okay. Um, it's going to cover sections 8.1 through what we look at in 8.4 today, and we're going to start just a little bit in Chapter 14. Okay, Chapter 14 is just a little different, though, from what we're doing here now, so we'll talk about that here in a little bit. We're not going too far in 14 on this test. Um, so it's mostly this Chapter 8 stuff, the working with the right triangles and the oblique triangles. Okay, that's what we're looking at there. Um, a week from today. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we listed all these dates up here one day, and I'll, I'll put those back up here. Actually, I'll just send them out to you in an email, okay, so that you'll have those, and I'll post them on the D2L side as well. But uh, a few of you indicated to me you'd try to do quiz nine on my math lab. That is, or should be, set up and ready to go now. So uh, evidently, it was not assigned or ready for you to do. I don't know what happened to quiz nine, but it is on there now. So um, it was a date issue on it. So I hadn't set it up exactly correctly. So at this point on your My Math Lab, there should be 11 quizzes, but there should be 10 that we have talked about. Okay, so you should be ready to do or have done 10 of those quizzes. Okay, the 11th one does involve Chapter 14, so we're probably not ready for that yet. Any questions about what's going on here? In the, at least the next week, anyway. Okay. It's still swirling, stay welcome, but uh, let's just kind of regroup here on what we've been doing in Chapter 8. One thing we want to do in this chapter is make sure that we know which method we're going to use to solve the triangles. And there is a part here um, in Section 8.3 under a, a piece called Mixed Practice where they don't tell you, you know, use right triangle trig, use law of sines, use law of cosines. You have to decide which one should be the one you're using. And that would be more real life. Like, you know, in real life, we don't get everything divided up into sections to where we know to use law of cosines here and law of sines there because we're in that section whatever of the textbook. So in the non-textbook world, you know, we need to be able to think about which method am I going to use. If it's a right triangle, I always recommend that you use the right triangle trigonometry, like, you know, the sine equals the opposite side over the hypotenuse and that sort of thing. Um, although the other methods do work for right triangles, okay? If it is not a right triangle, what do we call the triangles that were not right triangles? Uh, oblique, right, oblique is that word. So uh, with an oblique triangle, you might, depending on what you're given, you might want to use the law of sines. How do we know if we're going to use the law of sines? It's uh, side, 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 and side, and side are the two that you don't use the law of sines. Okay, so, so uh, Stephen oh, couldn't hear you over there. Okay. Uh, side, 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 and side, angle, side are the two that you don't use uh, law of sines for. Right, those are the two that we do not use the law of sines for because what we're looking for to use that law of sines is an angle and the side across from it, right? An angle and the side across from it, we have to know that. Now, we'll have to know some other piece of information also, but we must have that uh, angle and side across from it given to us. Um, when we have the side, 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 or the uh, side, angle, side, either one, then we don't have the angle and the side across from it, okay? Well, my computer's still firing up here, still saying welcome and swirling. I don't know what's going on with the computer this morning, so I'm not sure there. Um, when we do have side, 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 or side, angle, side, what are we going to use? That's where we use the law of cosines. Now, if we have side, angle, side, we're going to start out by finding that missing side, and that's how those... Um, Law of cosines, how the formula is set up. You know, remember it started out looking like c squared equals a squared plus b squared. It looked like the Pythagorean theorem at first, but then we subtract 2ab cosine of angle c. And we said we could adapt that to fit whichever side it is we're looking for. Okay. Then um, if we're given side, 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 in that situation, we don't know any of the angles. 
Okay, so we had a way to solve for one of the angles there. We went through, we in class last time, we went through the law of cosines formula and solved it for one of the angles and we adapted it to whichever angle we wanted to use. You all remember that? That part there? So we used that. Um, actually, what you could do is just plug into the, the uh, original formula and do the algebra and solve it out there. So that's what we're looking at here. Um, Oh, it just came on. That's good. I was about to give up. I think something's been restarted maybe on these computers because that's what happens and then it takes them a while. All right. Let's go over here and look at a question you might have had from Section 8.3. Does anybody have a question from 8.3 over on page 532? Yeah, go ahead. 47C. All right. 47C. Let's see what we've got there on that one. Well, now I'm waiting for the part I write on to come up. I don't know. So 47, let's go ahead and read the problem. It was the baseball problem. A Major League Baseball diamond is actually a square 90 feet on a side. The pitching rubber is located 60.5 feet from home plate on a line joining home plate and second base. First it said how far is it from the pitching rubber to first base? How far is it from the pitching rubber to second base? And then if a pitcher faces home plate, through what angle does he need to turn uh, to face first base? Okay, so how far is he going to turn to, or the pitcher, you know, to face first base? So normally the pitcher is facing where? Home plate. Home plate. So if they're going to face first base, you know, we're turning this way from my direction, right? So you all are who I'm pitching to here. So let's see what we can do with this one. Tell you what, if that's not going to come on right here. Oh, I was going to use paper, but we'll be all right here. Here we go. Okay, um, over on 47. We have a square, but it's you know, to go in accordance with the baseball field, we'll put it something like this, okay? Because there's our bases. Here's home. First, second, third. Okay. Uh, it tells us it's 90 feet on a side. So all these are 90. The pitching rubber is located 60.5 feet from home plate on a line. Joining home and second here. So we're uh, 60.5 feet. Just this part. Yeah, I don't think I drew it big enough, did I? Sixty point five is what that is, okay. Now we pro might need some of this other information. We need some of that other information there. Did you already find the first parts? Okay. So the first part said, how far is it from the pitching rubber uh, there to first base? So let me pull this part out just a little bit. Okay. So here's where the pitcher's going to stand. Here's home. This is the part that's 60.5. We've got from here to first is 90, right? And then the question is, how far is it from the pitching rubber to first base? So we're looking for this piece right here. What did you call that piece when you did it? Uh, X. Just X? No, from talking about the distance from the pitching to first. Yeah, I have part A. X. A? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So as part A of the problem, we'll call it A for the distance there as well. Okay, so this one... What do we know here? <coughs> this is what, I'm just kind of pulling this piece out of the original picture. You all see what I'm doing there? Pulling it out of the original original picture there. Um, what else do we know on this triangle? I know the, uh, the angles from home to first and uh, second to first are going to be equal and also going to be equal at first. Okay, so we know that the angle from home to first 
and from first, or not first, second, second back to first, coming back that way. In other words, you're looking at this one and that one. Is that right? That they are going to be equal. Okay. We're in a square, right? So what are those angles going to equal? Okay. So this is a 90 degree angle, right? Right there. But so this piece that we're looking at is 45 degrees there. 45 degrees here. Which one did I pull out? This one right here would be 45 degrees then. Uh, we have pulled out a piece from the picture to first. We don't know what that angle is up there. It looks, mine's debatable looking in that original picture, but we don't know what that is. But the deal here is that we know side, angle, side, right? We're going to use the law of cosines to find A. So it's going to be A squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cosine angle a. Okay, So we have a squared equals, what do we call them, b and c? Well, these other two sides, you really you can call whichever one you want to. So um, 60.5 squared plus 90 squared minus 2 times 60.5 times 90. And it's always the cosine of that included angle, the one that's in between those two, so 45 degrees. We know that square root of 2 over 2 for the cosine of 45 degrees, but since we're getting some decimal value here, um, you might get what A squared is. You might go ahead from here on, since you're using your calculator, you might go ahead and get what A is. So uh, some of you, I see you're punching that in, so let me give you just a minute to, to work that one out. What are you getting for A there? 63.7. Okay, so that would be 63.7 feet. Okay. And I'm not sure if we need this for Part C just yet. Not going down there, but just kind of let's look at this problem and see what we're doing here, okay? Everybody get 63.7? If you do all the stuff that's on the right here and then take the square root of whatever that total is, that's how we're getting that 63.7 there, okay? All right, so um, any questions on part A? What about part B? Go through that part real quick. How far is it from the pitching rubber to second base? Okay. So part B, we've got from the pitcher up to second base. Okay. Over here we still have first base, right? We know that's 90 from second to first. Okay. We know this angle right here. Yeah, I've got to make sure I'm looking at it right here. And from the pitcher to first base, now we know that one, right? That was the 63.7 that we just found. Okay. <coughs> Am I looking at it right? Let's see. How far is it from the pitching rubber up to second base? So we're looking for this piece right here. I'll call it B since we're on part B. Okay. So first to second is 90 feet. We just found that from the uh, the pitcher over to first base was 63.7 feet. Forgot my R there. What can we do? Yeah, it looks like we can use the law of sines here, doesn't it? Can we? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what angle are you going to find, or what, what else are you going to find here? Do we know either of these other two angles? Um, no. Uh, well, 
uh, the first uh, base angle on the uh, first going to second, mm-hmm. or what would that be, pitcher first, second angle? Uh, that one would be 45 as well. Well, remember, remember, even though my drawing looks a little crazy up here, let me try to redraw a little bit. Let's see what we've got here. This was just up to uh, 60.5 for there, right? See what I'm saying? We're not all the way to the middle there. We got this. We got this. We just found. What did we just found? Find 63.7. I'm trying to draw my picture a little better here. Okay. So what do we know? What do you say when we know? We mean first base. Um, so if we went up to the middle of this, then it would be 45 over there, right? But the question is how far from where the pitcher is to second base, and the pitcher's not in the middle there. Go ahead. Couldn't we just go back to the, um, now that we know A from mm-hmm. the pitcher, couldn't we just go back and do the law of signs for the last problem to get angle A, and then do the law of signs for part B? Okay, so get which angle are you wanting? Uh, he's talking about going back to part A, finding an angle. You said angle A, but I've got, I already know this angle across from what we no, called no, side A. Uh, um, on on the... Right. Um, Angle A is the next problem, but first base to the pitcher's mound, and then you can just go. So, like you're wanting to find, let me go up here on this part up on the right. You want to find that? Um, the part down from it, and then you would know. You want to find this. Yeah, if you find that first part, then you would know the second part. Right, right. So, um, on the problem we had then over here, and my drawing does not look in accordance anymore with uh, what I've now drawn up here. My part A drawing with that, so my drawings leave a little to be desired there. So we know that's 90. We know those three sides in this little inset over to the right, the far right here is where we're looking now. So uh, Tom's suggesting we find this little piece that I'm coloring in, right, that angle right there. Okay, so that's what we're looking for right there. We could go back and find that. We could still use the law of cosines to find that one. So if we knew that, then that would give us the one up on the other side. That's an option. That's an option of something we could do. Let's see where that gets us. Um, so what are we going to say here? If you go back and do that, you remember how to find the angle up there? I don't know. Let's do some labeling here. We have, uh, this was side A. So angle A that we were using here was the 45 degrees. And... We'll call this one, I don't want to mix it up with where I put B in the other part, but we're actually looking at a totally different triangle in part B, okay? So keep that in mind. All right, so if you're going to find angle B up there, angle B, we looked at the formulas the other day, was the inverse cosine of, remember that? A squared plus C squared minus B squared over 2AC. And that was what we got when we saw for angle B in the uh, B squared equals A squared plus C squared minus 2AC cosine B. Okay, so we're actually still have to working with part A for a minute. We're just working with the whole baseball field here. So that would say B equals the inverse cosine of, and using what we've got up there in that one, I'm looking up here, okay, 63.7 squared plus 90 squared minus uh, 60.5 squared over 2 times 63.7 times 90. You all going to calculate that? I hope so. that going to give us there for angle B in the original problem in that first part
And while you're figuring that up, some of you are figuring that, um, you did Part B, right? And uh, I do think there's another option of another way to do Part B, but what did you use? My problem started with uh, A. I, I did both sides. Did you get the answer? Uh, close. You did get close? Okay. Hmm. How did you use law of signs for part A? Oh, okay. And so it's close, but not exactly yeah, is the okay. problem on that. So you got an estimate. Okay, so um, over here he was saying he used the law of signs for part A, but uh, we really didn't have enough information to use law of signs for part A without making an assumption. So for B, I got four and three points. For part B, oh, for angle B. Okay, so what are, well, what are we getting for angle B from this up here? Some of you surely have that now, right? 42 degrees. 42, so it's close, right? Yeah. It's close in there. Off your assumption, what your memory is of the baseball field there. So, so angle B, we're talking about this little piece right there, we said. But if we know that, then we know that other side of it, the complement of it, which would be what? 48. Okay, 48. Right there. And it didn't show up so well. And I'm screwing up my triangle now. 48 degrees. So that's the one I'm coming down now in my little square down here. It's not really a square, but where I'm writing about uh, part B of the problem, that's this angle here, right, that we just found. When I take it out of my drawing up on the far right, on the upper right, I'm taking that piece out. I'm putting the 48 degrees down here. We found it through the use of finding more information on part A. If we do it this way, then we definitely could use the law of signs now to figure out the side B. I think we could have used law of signs um, from the start here on this one. Did anybody try it? Yeah. Did it work for you? Not sure? No? Not sure. Well, let's see. So this is what I've got. Sine of 45 degrees over 63.7 equals the sine of 48 degrees over side B. I'm going to have to go down here just a little bit. So B is going to equal then 63.7 times the sine of 48 degrees divided by that sine of 45 degrees. Right? So what's that going to give us for side B? 66.97. Okay. We may have a little round off error in there somewhere, but um, that looks within reason there. We know it's got to be a little bit bigger than uh, the 63.7 because, you know, we have the 48 degrees there. Okay, 48 is a little bit bigger than 45. Any questions on getting that part using this method? So if you use the law, law of signs from the beginning, I guess what I was asking you, and that, is this what you tried, Brandon? Did you do the sine of 45 degrees over 63.7 equals uh, the sine of where the picture is, that angle over 90, and get that first? Yeah. Okay, so that gave you that, that would give you that angle right there. Yeah. And so what did it give you for that angle there? at about um, 87 degrees? Yeah. Because yeah. that's what I'm seeing now because 180 minus C. So we could have gotten that angle right there through the law of signs and then used that information. Uh, you know, then, then we could have gotten the 48 degree angle from that to have been across from side B. So that would have worked as well instead of using the law of cosines back in the other part. More than one way to get there. Right, more than one way to get there. Somehow we got to find a little bit more information here, though. Part C said if the pitcher faces home plate, through what angle does he need to turn to face first base? Okay, if the pitcher's facing home plate, so home plate, remember, uh, on my drawing up here, where's our home plate down there? 
Let me clean it. Let me bring this over here just a minute. Okay. Using this piece here, home plate's down here, right? 60 point something feet. I don't remember all the dimensions here. But through what angle does he turn to face first base? So actually we're looking at this angle over here now, aren't we? Okay, here's where the line is that goes down to home plate. So we want to know this angle here, which we can get because those are on a straight line. So what's 180 minus uh, 87 degrees? 93. Okay, so about 93 degrees will be the angle. That's all we're going to have to do at that point once we get part B. So we did need part B to kind of get to there, but we're looking at in part C, we've got, you know, the same setup we were seeing here from part B. We've got 87 degrees there where the pitcher is. We've got first base over here. This is down to home plate. What we're looking for is this angle the pitcher had to turn through. You say that's 93 degrees because they add up to 180. They're on the straight line, so they'll add up to 180. So about 93 degrees. Okay. Well, another thing we can... Um, work with with this law of cosines is uh, it enables us to use some of that information. Sometimes, well, sometimes we may have to use the law of cosines to find some missing pieces, but it gives us another way to find the area of a triangle. Okay, so we're going to look at how else we can find the area of a triangle besides, remember the formula you know already for the area of a triangle? What's that one? Area equals one-half base times height is what you're familiar with. So this is just a variation. We're going to look at two other area formulas here for just a moment. Um, anything else on this one up here about the baseball field? Math on the baseball field, right? So um, speaking of math on the baseball field, there's been some math going on over in the Reese Museum this week. If you're over um, that way by the Reese, uh, there are monks over there from Tibet who have... Uh, They've used a compass to draw out some design. They're putting little bits of sand in it to make it colorful. Um, today's the last day they'll be over there doing that. But you can just walk in and look at it if, you, if you're interested. Tomorrow night they're putting on a performance over here in the Culp. Uh, not with sand, but I think it's dances and chanting and singing or something, right? Sounds interesting. But anyway, you might want to check out the sand art over there. A lot of math was used to, to draw that and design it. So... All right, um, let's go over here to area for just a minute in section 8.4. We're still going to be using the law of cosines a little bit in this part. Area of a triangle. We think of area equals one-half base times height on our triangle. Um, this chapter 8 has been a lot of formulas, right? A lot of formulas in here. And... Uh, I'm going to give you, you know, the law of sines, law of cosines. I won't give you the Sokotoa. You've got to know that stuff, okay? But I'll give you the law of sines, law of cosines. I think you all already know the law of sines, though. Um, I'll give you the area formulas. So you just have to know how to use these things, okay? So I've got two formulas for area in this part. They are using area as K now in section 8.4 because we keep using capital A's. To demonstrate that we're looking at an angle so to save confusion from that K is now going to be area so the first formula we're going to use it involves using the same information you have uh, to use the law of cosines if you have that two sides and the angle that's in between those two sides that side angle side then you can use this formula for area uh, one half a B sine of angle C okay one half a times B times sine of angle C. So this is a, if we know a triangle here, and we've got, let me try to draw, so let's say we know these things here in our triangle. Normally we would say, um, one half of the base times the height, right? Let's say this is all side B here. Uh, 
if we're looking at uh, this one over here that they're saying that we can say one half of one half of that a times the b part that we would know if we're knowing a b and angle c but what is the sine of angle c here If I'm looking in my right triangle right here that nailed the little piece. It'd be H over um, uh, hypotenuse, so H over A. H over A, right? So the sine of angle C in this problem here is H over A, but those A's will cancel, and that takes me back to 1 half base times height. So the 1 half AB sine C is a variation off of the 1 half base times height, but... Um, we're no, we are given here two sides and the angle in between them. That's what we would be given. So this is the formula we're going to look at using right there. If we know side, angle, side. Okay. Let me put one up here so that you can at least try out the formula there. This is number six off of page 538. It looks like this. So that would be A, this would be B, this would be C. We know side angle side, right? So that's what we're given here. The uh, thing is on this problem, to use one half base times height, I don't know the height of this triangle, right? I don't know the height of the triangle. But what I was showing you over there was if you know the sign of that angle that's in between the sides, you know that it will work out to still give you one half base times height when you use this new formula here. One half. Okay, so this time, you know, we were using one half AB sine angle C. That's going to be a problem on this one because those aren't the things I know. So how can I adapt that for this problem? K equals one half. The two sides I know, what are they? Okay, so I, well, I'm going to write it in the formula first, and then I'll come back and put in the numbers for you there. BC, sine of A. So when we know side angle side, it's going to be one half times the two sides times the sine of that angle that's in between them. We're still using trig, so this is using trig, though, to get the area of the triangle. So in our case here, we've got one half, three times four times the sine of 30 degrees. What's the sine of 30 degrees? Yeah, one half, right? We know that from the unit circle still. We haven't forgotten our unit circle, right? Okay, we don't want to forget that. All right, so K, or the area here, is equal to what? Three. three. Right, when you work that out, the area is equal to three. One fourth of 12, isn't it? Or one half of 12 is six times another half is three. So the area here is three. Now, they didn't give us uh, units to measure in here, but you will need to recall that area is measured in square units, okay? Whenever you find area, it's always square units. When you find volume, it's cubic units, okay? So we'll put that up here, square units. In your textbook, they actually just put three. So we had K equals one-half AB sine C. We just used K equals one-half BC sine A. What's the other one I might need to use? Yeah, one-half AC sine B. So like the law of cosines formulas, we can adjust it to fit whatever sides and angle we know. So those are the ones we're using right there. Those aren't too bad, are they? Those are pretty straightforward formulas. If you know side, angle, side, then you've got a formula that you can find area pretty easily with here for a triangle, area of a triangle. We have another area of a triangle formula in this section as well. Okay called Heron's formula. Okay, it's for if we know side, side, side. Now, the fact is, if we knew side, side, side,
we could find an angle by using the law of cosines, couldn't we? We could do that and still use uh, one of these if we wanted to. But we have another formula given to us here in this section. Let's put it up. It's called Heron's formula, another formula for area of a triangle. It's in your textbook over on page 536. And it looks like this. Area equals the square root of S times S minus A times S minus B times S minus C. You're going to have to know what S is, though, in here. S is going to be one-half of the sum of all the sides. And then we plug it into that formula to find the area. So this formula can be used to find the area of a triangle where we know side, side, side. So both of these have to do a little bit, you know, with where we use that law of cosines with those situations, those setups here. So once we find half of the sum of all the sides, we put that S value in there, and then we're using the A, B, and C are the three sides that we know. Okay. Let's try the formula. Let's go over here to back on page 538. This one's number 10 on that page, and they've got it drawn kind of like this. A, B, C. <coughs> They don't always put all the labels on as far as A, B, and C. I think it's probably more helpful to you to go ahead and do that. So in this problem, in the textbook, they had labeled the angles. I went ahead and labeled the sides accordingly. Okay. We want to find the area. Okay. We know side, side, side. So the first thing we need to do for this area formula is find what that S value is. One half of A plus B plus C. So that's one half of 8 plus 5 plus 4. And that's just going to be 17 halves, isn't it? So it's one half of 17. Let me write it in here. Okay, and now I can put that in the area formula. Remember, it was the square root of S times S minus A times S minus B times S minus C. <coughs> so I've got 17 halves times 17 halves minus 8. Maybe you're going to put that in as a decimal. I don't know. Are you? Is it going to be 8.5? Probably, let me just go ahead and change it because I think that's what you're going to do when you're working on this. 8.5, 8.5 minus 8, 8.5 minus 5, 8.5 minus 4. Those were my three sides, my A, B, and C. So I would, you could put this in your calculator now. I'm working it out a little bit further up here. Okay. If I go ahead and subtract, you all may go ahead and put it in. I don't know. So I would rather it be in fractions up here myself if I were working it like without the calculator here. So it's 17 halves, 1 half, um, 7 halves, and 9 halves. So that's what uh, 63 times 17. 17. Square root of 1,071, and it, then it's going to be divided by 4. You are probably putting it in your calculator up there sooner than that. Because I'd have to do the square root of 16 on the bottom. So 
What are you getting? May have it. Eight point eighteen, thank you. Eight point eighteen. See if you're getting eight point eighteen, because I'm guessing that you're gonna start putting it in your calculator possibly once you write it out in that step right there, where I just put the asterisk, okay? Or maybe the one right below it. I don't know which one. Make sure you can get that in there and and uh, do the square root then and get 8.18 once you plug into the formula. Like I say, I can give you that formula, but you need to know how to use it. Okay? That's part of it there is knowing how to use it. These aren't too bad to use on the areas. Look at that. A few of you are still checking it, so let me give you just a minute and see if you have a question there. Anybody have a question there on that one? Did you get it to work out okay? Yeah? So these uh, two formulas that you just showed us, these are basically for side and side and side, side, side only, and the others you just use the regular formula? If you know, right, if you already know the base and the height of the triangle, that's the deal here. We don't know the height of the triangle. We would know the height, though, if it's a right triangle, right? We would definitely know that. Um, otherwise, though, and these are more specifically looking at if you have side angle side, 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 side. They make it a little bit easier to find the area for those triangles in those cases, um, as long as you have that information. Again, though, if you have law of sines, something you're using with law of sines, an angle in the side across from it, and say some other side, you have the capacity to find some missing pieces and, and then use one of these formulas as well once you know the... Um, information that's required for the formulas. These are labeled in the book as more specifically geared toward um, side angle side if it's the one half AB sine C or um, side 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 for Heron's formula. Okay. Right, we're just looking for the area. That's all we're doing on these is finding the area. Okay. Any questions on that part? It's not too bad there, is it? That was the best section yet. Chapter 8, huh? All right, so uh, let's look at, let me find, I had one other problem here I wanted us to look at from this section here. Let me put one up here. Actually, I've got two problems. Okay. That wasn't quite true. Let me put one up and see what you get for it, okay? See which formula you're going to use and what will you get. This is number 24. There's no triangle drawn in the textbook. It looks like this. Okay? Take just a moment and plug that into a formula. Figure out which formula you're going to use for that one. So which formula are you using? Um, okay. 
to find the area though? Yeah, we would, okay, we would be using the law of cosines if we want to solve the triangle. So that's another good point. You know, solving versus finding area. Solving the triangles where we find the missing angles. We would use the law of cosines if we were doing that here. That's correct. To find the area, which area formula will you use? Parents' yeah. formula, right? It's kind of a nice formula. Has anybody used it before? So see what you get for the area there. Just making sure we're getting it to work out okay for us. Round it to two decimal places if you need to. And what do you have? 5.33. Okay, so S was equal to one half of four plus three plus six. 13 halves. So K was then the square root of, I don't know, did you use 13 halves or 6.5? I used 6.5. 6.5, okay. 6.5 minus side A, 6.5 minus side B, and 6.5 minus side C. And are you all putting it in your calculator there, or are you going one more step, or what? You're going to this step I'm writing now? Or did you do it from the part above? I'm just curious. Now? Okay, from this part. And what did you get in 5.33? Okay, 5.33. The area. Any questions on how to get that area? So let's look at a word problem over here. Uh, it's kind of a word problem. It's using something from before also. This is number 33 down on page 538. And we have a circle on this one. We've got this going on here. That's 8. We've got this little sector zoned off. They've got this part up here in blue. That's the drawing we have going on. Something like that there. We have that this is 70 degrees. And the question here says, Find the area of the segment shaded in blue in the figure of a circle whose radius is 8 feet formed by a central angle of 70 degrees. So just what we have drawn, what we're trying to do is find the area of the blue part. How would we go about finding the area of that blue part there? Okay, if I find the area of the whole circle, and I area. if I subtract the area of the triangle from the area of the whole circle, though, that's going to leave me also, it's going to leave me with the blue part, but it's also going to leave me with all this piece out here, right? If I just subtract off the triangle, see what I'm saying? That part, I'll be left with that area as well. So you're on the right track, though. I do need to subtract something, find something and subtract. What can I find? Well, since it's a circle, that means that all parts, uh, I'm taking it that the point in the middle is the center of the circle. Yeah, that's supposed to be the center, right? Whoops, the one I just accidentally erased. All right. So if we're doing that, all parts of the circle are equidistant from the center, so the other side of the triangle would also be 8. That's also 8. That's true. So now we have side angle side, we and do. we can get the other side of the triangle and then work from there. Okay, we could. What else can we do? Okay, go ahead. Find the area of the 
She says this. That's what she's saying from the area of this. Okay, so this piece here, like if you're cutting a piece of pie out of the circle, right? That's called the sector. So we can find the area of the sector. I think that's what you're both saying. Find the area of the sector of the circle and then take the area of the triangle out of the sector, right? That's what we want to do. So find the area of the sector and subtract the area of the triangle. Okay. Well, back in chapter six, I know that's been a little while since we've been back in chapter six, but we had a formula to find the area of a sector of a circle. Remember that? We had the arc length formula, S equals R theta, to find that little arc piece up there on the, uh, the edge of the sector. But we also had the formula for the area of a sector. Remember what that one was? One half R squared theta. The deal was, though, when we were back in Chapter 6 and using the formula for the area of a sector of a circle or the formula for the arc length, either one, our uh, angle, our central angle, had to be given in radians. Remember that also? Our central angle had to be given in radians to use that formula. So 70 degrees, what's that going to be? Remember how we converted to radians? I'm yeah, you uh, multiply one over one or pi over 180. Okay, so I'm getting 7 18 pi. Looks like 7 18 pi. So on my area of my sector, it looks like I have one half. What's my radius? So 8 squared. 7 18 pi. Well, you're going to get a decimal for that, I'm sure, anyway, even though we're going to have a little round-off error going on. But uh, so what do you have there? One-half times 64 times 7 eighteenths pi. So that's going to give us the area of the whole sector. They actually told you in the textbook... They say in here, sometimes on these they're giving you little hints, and they say here, hint, subtract the area of the triangle from the area of the sector to obtain the area of the segment. I want to make you think about that a little bit. So, All right, so uh, what are we going to get there? Area equals, for the sector? 39.1. 39.1, okay. That's for the whole sector then. Now we need the area of that triangle, so we can subtract that part off from this 39.1. Everybody get 39.1 there? Okay. We ready to do the area of the triangle? Well, since it's side angle side, we know we can use this new formula of the day, right? K equals one half A B sine angle C, where we're letting both of those um, the radius measures there be A and B, and the included angles angle C, the 70 degree angle. And on this one, it's fine to leave on this formula. It's fine to leave the angle in degrees. So it looks like we're going to have K equals one half eight times eight. Nine seventy degrees. So what do you get for that part? What are we getting for the area of the triangle? Thirty point zero seven. So I'm hearing thirty point zero seven. Is that what you're getting? Everybody getting 30.07? Still not finished, though, because this was the area of the sector up there. This is the area of the triangle here. We've got to take which one minus which one? 
Right, so the sector minus the triangle on the areas, right? So the sector minus the triangle. What's that giving us? 9.03. Yeah, so 9.03 should be the shaded blue part. Okay, that's the area of that shaded blue piece that we first looked at. So this was a multi-step problem. Lots of areas involved. We're doing lots of geometry here on this piece. So 9.03, that sector, um, not the sector, but the little blue shaded part there out on the end. Okay. Any questions about that problem there? Anything else about area or law of cosines? So I want you to take a deep breath. We're going to do something a little different, okay, in Chapter 14. We're going to move over to 14 for just a, a little bit. And the reason I say it's a little different because uh, this is where we're doing a little preview of calculus, okay? We're not doing calculus today. Don't get nervous, okay? We're not doing calculus. That doesn't scare some of you. Some of you look a little like, what? Um, we're just going to talk a little bit about limits and tables and graphs and substituting in values here. So we're just looking at, uh, no, we're not going too far in Chapter 14 anyway, but we're just going to look at the first part of this here. So let's go over here for a minute. I just want to go ahead and put some of this out here today to get you started to think about it over the weekend before Tuesday. And then on Tuesday we will be... Uh, Going back through and reviewing some things. Um, somebody had asked, could I give you some review problems? I've, I've been giving you some out of the textbook, so I'll either have some from the textbook that I'll post on D2L later today, or I will give you, uh, or I'll go ahead and list some on a sheet, one or the other, that I'll post, okay, for you. So I will have some review problems of some sort out there for you to work with starting uh, later today. Okay, and I'll send you an email then about that. But in Chapter 14, this first section, 14.1, is called Finding Limits Using Tables and Graphs. Now, in this textbook, they just try to introduce this concept of a limit. But in Chapter 14, they also try to introduce the idea of a derivative and an integral as well. That's a little too much to throw into one chapter here at the end of pre-cal, I think. So we're just going to kind of focus on getting uh, this concept of a limit down for you a little bit. Okay, so that those of you who are going on into calculus, that might give you a little bit of a head start in there just to have that little bit of a background. Okay, and I know some of you are going to calculus, however, some of you are not, but this will still give you a little background. Okay. Um, a limit. What is the idea of a limit? First off, here's how we're going to write it. We write it like this. The limit as x approaches some value c of f of x. And in your textbook, I don't like this, but they put equals a capital N right here for the limit. In your calculus textbook, though, normally they'll have it like that. The limit L, okay? Just whatever the limit is. So in our text... They've got it, the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals n. Okay, where n or l, whichever way you want to look at it, is the actual limit value. So this reads the limit as x approaches c. Actually, I should probably put it like this. Hold on one second if you're writing. Put the limit of f of x as x approaches c, where f of x is the function we're looking at. Okay, f of x is the function. The limit idea kind of connects the algebra and the geometry to the calculus concept. Okay, so it's what helps integrate that algebra and um, geometry and obviously trigonometry eventually 
into the calculus. So we have this notation over on page 866. I'm going to put it down here in case you want to look at look up some of this stuff, okay? The limit of f of x, the limit of the function as x approaches c equals the number n is how they're stating it. That's why they're doing an n. So I'm going to put here, I keep using the eraser for some reason. In the calculus text, usually it's like this. And in our text, though, it's n because they're saying equals the number n. That's what they're saying there. Um, they've got two little yellow boxes here on page 866 that I'm highlighting with you also because it, the first one says for all x approximately equal to c. C is also a numerical value. Um, for all x approximately equal to c with x not equal to c, the corresponding value of the function is approximately equal to n. And then it, in the other one it says uh, another description of what this is telling us is as x gets closer to c, a lot of times we say that, you know, as x gets closer to c, but remains unequal to whatever the value of c is, the corresponding value of the function gets closer to n. So that's what we say here. We're first going to look at this using a table. So for a moment we're going to use a table, and I might ask you to use your calculator to get some of the values on this table. So let me put something up here. Let's go over here to um, the limit as x approaches um, 3 of 5x squared. And this actually is example 1 in your textbook because, again, I wanted to put something out here that you could look back at, and then we'll do one of the problems from the exercises here in a minute. The limit as x approaches 3 for this function 5x squared, we want to know the limit value. So in other words, a while ago I had x is approaching c. Our c value is now the 3. Okay, that's what x is approaching. What we're trying to figure out is as the x values get closer to 3, when we're looking at the function y equals 5x squared, what is happening to the y values? We're looking at the behavior of the function. We're trying to analyze the behavior. So that's what we're looking for here, looking at, when we, anytime we do a limit, we're looking at the behavior of the function. Which one thing we're kind of saying there is, what is y, what's y or the function value, um, and I'm going to use this concept of getting closer. What is y getting closer to as x gets closer to whatever the c value is? I'm going to put 3 here. That's what we mean by the behavior of a function. Okay? What are the y values getting closer to as the x values are getting closer to whatever they told us they were getting closer to? So looking at this with a table, we would look at it as something like this. You know, you all have done your XY charts before, right? When you've done graphing and so forth in the past. Here, though, I'm seeing, you know, C is that 3. This 5X squared is my F of X. So my function here is Y equals 5X squared, right? Or F of X equals 5X squared. F of X and Y interchangeable, right? Interchangeable values or inter interchangeable expressions, I should say. So if x is getting closer to 3, what kind of values are getting closer to 3? Tell me a number that's getting close to 3. 2 is probably the first thing you think of. 2 is getting close to 3. How about 2.5? That's getting close to 3. How about 2.9? How about 2.99? That's getting close to 3, right? Well, if I look at y equals 5 times 2 squared to see what my y value would be here, because I'm ultimately trying to figure out what my function values or my y values are getting closer to as the x's are getting closer to 3. So here I have 5 times 4 is 20. Okay. What if I put in 2.5? 
5 times 2.5 squared. I'm just figuring out what the y values would be. Somebody calculate that one there. It's a 31.25. Well, that was a big jump, wasn't it? So 31.25. And if I put in 2.9... What do I get when I put in 2.9? Just using that function um, that we were given up there in the original problem. Could you just yeah, but I hadn't told you that yet. <laughs> so how many of you have done calculus before? Yep, okay. <laughs> we're going to see that here in a minute. Okay, what's 2.9 squared times 5? Somebody give me that number. 42.05. 42.05. Okay, so that's what we got there. 2.99. Or 44.70. 44.70. Thank you. Okay. So as we're getting close to 3, as we're getting close to 3, it looks like our values are getting close to 45 is what it does look like we're getting close to. It's looking like our limit's 45. We cannot totally determine that yet because not only can we look at values getting close to 3, you know, you're talking about coming towards 3, 3 on your number line, from the left of 3, right? I mean, all these values I've plugged in are to the left of the number 3, 2, 2.5, 2.9, 2.99. There's also values that are getting close to 3 if I were looking from the right of 3. What are some of those values? Four. Okay, so he said four. What'd you say? Okay, 3.01 is close in, 3.1. That's not quite as many, but let's plug these in and just make sure that as we get closer to three, so in other words, you know, three is actually right in here somewhere. Okay, as we get closer to three, are these values also approaching 45? If I put in four, that one's pretty easy for us to see. Uh, 5 times 16 is 80. That doesn't look close to 45. But let's get closer in. These other values you gave me were a whole lot closer in to the 3. So 5 times 3.1 squared. What's 5 times 3.1 squared? Somebody do that one, please. Okay, 48.05. So that's going with our belief that we're getting closer to 45. What about um, 5 times 3.01 squared? 45.3. Okay, 45.3. So do you still think it's getting close to 45? What this is telling me that is that if I'm on a graph here, and as my x's get close to 3, whether I look at them getting close to 3 or, as we like to say, approach 3 from the left or from the right, my y value is getting really close to 45. So that tells me 45 is my limit. That is the answer to the question I was initially asked. I looked at it through the use of this table. Remember, this section was called using tables and graphs to find a limit. Okay. Now, uh, what Amelia said over here, she said, we can, couldn't we just plug the number in? Well, what happens if you put 3 in to that 5x squared? You got 45, right? So it worked. Okay, there are a few stipulations for being able to do that, but often you can just plug the number in. When you're working with a limit, you can just substitute that value in, and if it works out for you, there's your limit. Sometimes it doesn't work out. We have to resort to other methods then. Okay? If it wouldn't work out if the limit did not exist. I haven't told you about when the limit doesn't exist yet, but it would not work out if the limit doesn't exist. It may be something that we need to simplify the expression in order to make it work out when we plug the value in. If it's a continuous function, does anybody know what a continuous function is? If it's continuous, then it's not discontinuous. So what's 
You all know the meanings probably of those words, right? You can uh, draw it without your pen leaving the paper. Okay, if it's continuous, you can draw it without your pen leaving the paper. Okay? If it's discontinuous, it has some sort of break in it, and you have to, you know, your pen leaves the paper, right? So if it's a continuous function, then you should be able to plug in that value, like you said, into the function, and it gives you the limit. I want you to see that what's happening here with the table. That's why I put the table up here, but no, it's not really realistic for us to use these tables every time we try to do a limit, is it? Mm, not really. Let's also look at this one uh, on a graph here. Just to kind of get a, an idea of what we're seeing. It was f of x equals 5x squared. If I'm at 1, I'm up here at 5. Zero is at 0. It is a parabola. If I'm at negative 1, I'm still at 5. Right? So it's doing something like this. Well, the problem with this one is I can't see where it goes. Because what we wanted to see was as the x's get closer to 3, like we were plugging in on the table, what's happening with the y's? Well, these y's are way up there on this one. At exactly where? 45, right? We already said they're at 45. We know that when we're at the point 3, we're at the y value 45, giving us that 45 for the limit there. As the x's are getting closer to 3. I've drawn those arrows to show from the left and from the right. Our function would be following that curve up there from either direction, but kind of coming in and converging on that y value of 45. That's what we're looking at with the limit there when that happens. So I just wanted to kind of introduce that concept today. Um, we don't have a lot of time to do things with this, but they give you some... Um, well, there are some practice problems in the textbook. I'm going to let you practice a little. And if you can just plug that number in, that's fine. Plug it in and see what you have there. And just be thinking about uh, what we looked at with these. So I'm going to skip around just a little bit here. First off, I'm going to skip back to the area of a triangle and do some problems there to practice with on 8.4. Those were over on page 538 using those two new area formulas. Let's look at numbers um, 5 through 23 odd. Just make sure you see how to use those formulas. And then I'll give you two word problems there, 35 and 37. 37 is to find, uh, to work with the area of home plate. So we've got a lot of baseball questions here for any baseball fans. And then in section 14.1, over on page 870, I just want you to try. You can use a table if you want, okay? Or you can plug in the value. I'll let you go with either way here. But let's try seven. Some of them you may have to use a table. I'm going to give you one with a graph on it, too, to try. Let's try those and see what you can do with uh, that part there, okay? Just to kind of get a start on that. Think about those. Any questions? today. My math lab, you should be able to do those 10 quizzes. I mean, hopefully, you're, hopefully you've already done a bunch of them and you just are ready to do 9 and 10, which are more about chapter 8. Okay. But if not, you do need to be working on those. All right. You all have a great day, a great weekend. I'll see you back next week.